Okay, we're now going to have a 10 minute rebuttal and we're going to try and uh, stay with the time limit and then after that uh, Yusuf will have 10 minutes to answer and then we will have a, a five minute closing statement from each of them. Okay, inshallah. Okay, we're now going to have a 10 minute rebuttal and um, we're going to try and st uh, stay with the time limits and then after that uh, Yusuf will have 10 minutes to answer and then we will have a, a 5 minute closing statement from each of them, okay. inshallah. I'm sorry I didn't clap, I was talking to Gary there but uh, that was, uh, that was worth, Worth clapping. Uh, I'm really only sorry about one thing tonight, and that's that um, all my students have gone home. Um, that would have been great, because what you presented um, is kind of like their curriculum. Uh, that's, that, that's all the stuff they have to wade through in three years of theological um, study and um, you've, um, if you were a student at George Whitfield College, you'd you'd be up on top. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it's hard to get them out of the Bible and into the critics. Um, yeah, I, I'm as a bear with a with a with a, a slow brain, and so I'm struggling a little bit to know where to pick up on, on, um, on all of that stuff. Uh, I suppose, I think in a general sort of way, I ought to say, um, I ought to say that, uh, I ought to confess to begin with, that I do believe that the Bible is the infallible and inspired word of God, um, but you're absolutely right that there are other forms of Christianity that don't um, hold to that, and I don't think that it's necessary to believe that to be a Christian, uh, I think it's necessary to believe that Jesus is the Lord, uh, the risen Lord and Christ. I think once you do believe that, then you will start to read the New Testament in a new way, and uh, I think you will come to the conclusion ultimately that it is the Word of God. Um, let me perhaps begin with this uh, question of the texts and uh, how to sort of get some sort of sense of proportion because of everything that, um, that Yusuf has said about the number of texts and the variants and all that sort of thing is true. Um, we take the Gospel of John for an example. John wrote his Gospel and uh, he wrote it once. He wrote it out by hand and the next copy was copied and the next copy was copied so it came down there were no printing presses in those days for the first 15 1600 years uh, every copy of the sacred scriptures was handwritten and that's true of the quran too of course and when copyists copy a whole book by hand they make mistakes and so if you pick up any ancient manuscript and you compare it with another manuscript you'll find some small differences. I, 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 I've been struggling with this one just to try and get a, 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 a feeling, I have a feeling for it because I work with this every day and I know, that the, I know that the New Testament that I'm reading is the New Testament that was uh, written by, by John and the other apostles. Uh, maybe there's a few words difference here and there, but I know it's, I know it's, 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 I know where the problems are and I can look at the problems and I can judge the severity of the problems and, and, and I can just only stand before you and say that the New Testament we have is the New Testament, essentially the New Testament that came from the apostles. But let, let me try and put it this way. Um, when, when, when I was born, uh, in the English-speaking world, there was really only one English Bible that was known, and that was the authorised version, the King James Version, and that was based on manuscripts, Byzantine manuscripts, that uh, are now regarded to be not the best manuscripts available. They were manuscripts that dated back to about perhaps 1,000, um, 1,200 uh, A.D., 
And then, of course, all these manuscript discoveries that have been made in the last 200 years have given us manuscripts of the New Testament that go back, well, right to the edge of the first century. A fragment of the Gospel of John uh, was found that has been dated to a, about no later than 115, which uh, I have to contradict you on one point there, makes it quite impossible that the Gospel of John was written in the second century. It was written well into the first century of a copy of it was found in Egypt that was written uh, in 115. The point I want to make is this. The Bible that I use now, where is it? Well, this is the NIV. Um, it's a reasonable translation. It's not a perfect translation, um, but it's okay. It's based on the best manuscripts. Now, so in a few places you'll find it's different from the authorised version, from the King James Version. But I am totally happy to use the King James Version as my Bible. In fact, I'll pick up any modern Bible and I'm happy to use it in my Bible. They're essentially all the same. The differences are not great. Um, you, you come to me with an authorised version and I'll sit there with you with the, the New International Version and, and let's see what the differences are. It's the same Bible. There's something perhaps that... Um, well, let, let me go... For, so so the, the text of the New Testament has not been invented. The text of the New Testament has come down to us from the very, very earliest times. And the fact that there are so many manuscripts just makes it easier to pick up where there's a problem. But anyway, I know this is a very technical and there's a whole science devoted to it, but I'll, uh, I'll leave it. What, what we say as Christians, we don't say that this, in every word, is the infallible word of God. We talk about the, the word of God uh, as originally given. That is, we say what was spoken by, what was written by the apostles originally was the word of God. And most Christians, well perhaps not most Christians, but uh, most educated Christians know that what we have is, um, is, is something which has uh, been passed down, uh, but which something which is 99% which is accurate to what was originally given. Um, the next thing I want to say something about is, is the dates of the first century documents because this uh, is very important in relation to the fact that there of course were many, many, there was a whole explosion of literature. Uh, Jesus, the, the event was so incredible, the things that happened were so magnificent that every man and his dog got to writing about them. Now that's, that's clear and many of these writings have come down to us and we have many other writings other than the writings that are there in the New Testament. What, what is special about the writings of the New Testament is that they are the writings which the early Christians who were in a position to know judged had come from the apostles and their immediate followers and all of the New Testament books come from that first generation there's not a book in the New Testament that was written after the end of the first century. The oldest book in the New Testament, and some people argue about this, but, uh, but let's, let's put the worst possible construction on and say the oldest book, in, sorry the oldest, I'm getting my, uh, I need to stand on my head. I mean the most recent book in the New Testament is the Gospel of John which was written perhaps in the 90s at the very latest. There isn't a book in the New Testament that was written, that was not written within the memory span of those who actually knew Jesus. When the last book of the New Testament was written, there were still people around who knew Jesus and remembered him. And the reason all these other writings were excluded from the New Testament, well, most of them come from the 2nd century, 3rd century and 4th century. And I've only got two minutes left and I've just started. Um, what am I going to say in two minutes? I don't know. Um, I think I want to say that uh, I, I want to acknowledge another problem that Yusuf didn't acknowledge. And that is that Jesus taught in the Aramaic language. And that very early in the peace, uh, the, the, as the apostles began to preach, even in Jerusalem, they ran across people who didn't speak Aramaic. So they had to decide what they were going to do. And the apostles' answer to that was that the, the gospel should be translated into Greek and taught in Greek. 
and they established a tradition there and a principle in Christianity which needs to be understood and that is that the word of God is not in the syllables. The word of God is not the individual words. It is, but I'm trying to make a point here. The word of God is the meaning. God is proclaiming a message to the human race. And of course it's in words. But if that message comes to you, say, in the Gospel of John, and you are, your life is changed by it, and you write out a copy of that Gospel of John, and you make a couple of mistakes in the words, and the next person comes and reads that, it is still the Word of God if the message has not been changed. That's why we can translate it into any language in the world, and it's still the Word of God. That's why I can stand in a pulpit and preach it, and it can be the Word of God. Of course, I always have to go back and check, right back, go back, check to the Greek text, go right back to the beginning to see that what I'm saying really is consistent what, with what was originally given. But the fact is we can do that. Thank you. <laughs> See, you see, the last time uh, when we had the debate in Devon, we had the gong. Uh, maybe we should have introduced that gong, but uh, David, you've been fine. Um, just to start off, and David's made quite a number of points um, in his particular uh, uh, discussion and in his discourse. I'm just quite surprised. In the rebuttal section, David says he has no problem accepting the authorized King James Version. Now I've got before me, this is the Holy Bible, the Revised Standard Version, printed, uh, re-edited in 1971, and in the preface regarding the King James Version, the authors of the Revised Standard Version, which is published and backed by no less than um, uh, 50 different cooperating denominations, 32 scholars, what are described as scholars of the highest eminence, they state here in the preface, yet the King James Version has grave defects. By the middle of the 19th century, the development of biblical studies and the discovery of many manuscripts more ancient than those upon which the King James Version was based made it manifest that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision. Now it's not just a question of basically minor insignificant differences. These are significant major differences. I mean, the first epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. How many of you Christians have heard this? How many Muslims have heard this? Have you heard this verse before? But that verse is not contained, contained in this particular Bible. That verse is not contained in the New International Version that David basically reads. It's found in the Authorized King James Version, and it's found in the vernacular translation like the Zulu, the Khoza, and other hundreds of languages because they are based on the King James Version. You, you could go further. I've got here before me, and th these, are, these are conservative writers. I've got here the New Testament in modern English. Uh, for schools by J.B. Phillips, written in the 50s or 60s. In the beginning, and this is what they say, it's not something which we've got liberal scholars or radical, higher critical scholars. These are conservative writers. And he writes in the introduction to the Gospel of Matthew. Early tradition ascribed this Gospel to the Apostle Matthew. But scholars nowadays almost all reject this view. The author, whom we can still conveniently call Matthew, has plainly drawn on the mysterious Q, which may have been a collection of oral traditions. He has used Mark's gospel freely. He has used Mark's gospel freely. In the language of the school teacher, whoever the author was, he was copying wholesale from Mark. Now how is it possible that an eyewitness and an ear witness to the ministry of Jesus, whom the, apostle, the, the disciple Matthew was supposed to be, why would he go and copy or take the writings of Mark, who was a ten-year-old boy when Jesus upbraided his nation? Why? And you open them up, look at Matthew 9, 9. And as Jesus was walking by the way, he, Jesus, saw a tax collector sitting at the receipt of custom. And he, Jesus, in inverted commas, said unto him, Matthew, follow me. And he, Matthew, arose and followed him, Jesus. Was that inspired? Did Jesus say that? 
Did Matthew say that? If Matthew had written that, he would have said, And as I was sitting at the root seat of custom, uh, Jesus came past forth, and He came up unto me, and He called me, and I arose, and I followed Him. It's a third person. You could go on further. I mean, I've got here before me, and I, I feel like probably shooting myself for not having brought them. These were beautiful scrolls that I did. I've just got here the, gospel, the genealogy of Jesus Christ um, in Matthew. For some reason or the other, I left out uh, Luke's uh, genealogy at home. I thought I'd brought two genealogies along with me. But if you look, for example, at even Matthew's genealogy, you open up and you look at Matthew's genealogy, and you see they've got significant problems. I mean, at the end of Matthew, for example, um, you'd basically find that Matthew just basically traces Jesus' family line to Joseph. But over and above that, the remarkable thing is that at the end of Matthew, from Abraham to David, he stresses that there were 14 generations. From David to the destruction of, of um, uh, Judah by the Babylonians, there were 14 generations. And from the Babylonian disaster to the birth of Jesus, there were 14 generations. But when, when you actually physically count them, you find the number of generations are lower. They even 13. When Matthew, in fact, gives some of his genealogy, he quotes from 1 Chronicles. And you see that in certain respects, when you go to Chronicles and you look at the particular names there, there are more names that Matthew has left out. Because if he added them, he wouldn't come to his total 14. Now, this is not just basically textual criticism, but I mean, but this is something which is fundamental or intrinsic to the actual text of the Bible. So even if we were to assume that the Gospels or the New Testament as we have it today is original even in the original you have inerrancy so it's not just inerrancy on the basis of textual criticism alone there is inerrancy within the context of the actual New Testament themselves I mean the disciples of Jesus if one were to tell you that uh, Jesus had 12 disciples or one were to tell you that Jesus had 13 disciples or 14 disciples many of you will not believe it but if you have to look at the accounts as they found in Matthew in Mark and in Luke maybe at question time you can ask me and we can do that exercise we don't have time now but you'd find that in certain Gospels certain names are mentioned of individuals being disciples of Jesus who are not disciples in the other Gospels for example Thaddeus or uh, other particular people, Judas, son of Alphaeus, and so on, who are not found. So how does one explain this particular anomaly? How does one explain, for example, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, you find a cataclysmic event occurring. I don't have my um, King James Version. In Matthew 27, verse 51, the graves were open and the dead arose, and afterwards they walked into the streets of Jerusalem. If that would happen here in Cape Town, what would happen? You see dead people walking on the streets, what would have happened? It would be world news. Yet you find in all the Gospels and all the other writings, only Matthew records it. How come? How come that particular event is not narrated in other particular writings? It's not narrated in any of the other writings of Mark, Luke, John, Acts of the Apostles. I mean, even in the Acts of the Apostles, even in the writings of Paul in Corinthians, Paul himself again and again emphasizes many times that the writings that he had written um, concerning the virgins, or concerning the unmarried, I have no inspiration of the Lord, but I give my own account, my own opinion. I, Paul, think this. I, Paul, say such. In another particular passage, what's called the Epimenides Paradox, Paul has a quotation which says all Cretans are liars. It's quite interesting when you look at it, because in the quotation, the actual quote is given by an actual Cretan prophet. So if the Cretan prophet whom Paul quotes says all Cretans are liars, then that statement would not be true. The point I'm trying to emphasize is that when you look at the, the text itself, the Gospels themselves, it's not just what I gave you is a... How much time do I have left, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman? 20 minutes. <laughs> Uh, w w one minute. The, the point I'm trying to emphasize that it goes... Uh, uh, I see, I've just got about one minute. I'll just wrap up here. The point is when you go through all these particular Gospels, you find this evolutionary process that takes place. There is a change in the account, a change in the narration, as if each of the particular writers, and they agree they were writing at different times, they were trying to establish certain theological points to that particular community. It's quite interesting that even in the Gospels as they stand, and we accept the injury 
reveal or the revelation that was given to Jesus, if you were to look at a red letter Bible and you look at all the words of Jesus in red and you cut off all the duplications, you won't be able to fill no more than two columns of a newspaper. That's how little do you have of the words of Jesus. The vast majority of the words are in black. Which means even the existing words of Jesus, we don't have them contained. And sometimes where they are in existence, many scholars tell us that in certain aspects they are doubtful. Some of these sayings are spurious. Some of them are words put in the amount of the other writers. Sometimes Matthew quotes a particular prophet. He'll quote a prophecy allegedly said by Jeremiah. But you look up Jeremiah, you won't find the prophecy. You'd find the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9, where Matthew quotes an incorrect prophet and so on and so forth. So I think these are particular problems and difficulties that we need to accept and admit and certainly from the Christian perspective I'm not saying that you have to now discard the Bible or the Bible is not worth value. Certainly there are ethical paradigms that we can find in the context of the New Testament. There's uh, moral teachings which are acceptable to both many times Muslims and Christians. But what we are saying is that one has to come back to this point which emphasized again and again, and I basically conclude on this, that a Christianity dependent on the inerrancy of the Bible would not survive the reality of the actual problems that have arisen, that modern scholarship have basically given up. These are not Muslim scholars or Hindu scholars of certain bias or certain leaning or Jewish scholars, for example, uh, with a particular bias against the New Testament. These are sometimes in most instances conservative biblical scholars that are making their particular position. And so I'd conclude on that point. I thank you David for that uh, generous uh, response and certainly we hope that the debate and discussion can continue in a similar fashion. Thank you for being such an attentive audience.